We did a thing um, last weekend, interestingly, where we, we organised an event in Norton House Hotel. We got people from all four parts of the United Kingdom to come with five from Northern Ireland, five from Wales, five from England, five <coughs> from Scotland, a whole range of people from teachers, head teachers, all sorts of different backgrounds, different levels of people, to talk about what are the lessons that we might learn. Um, and the people from England, when they were summing up what they would tell an alien about their system, he said, it's like a really centrally controlled dog's breakfast, <laughs> was, was the message. And there was a big message about how diverse it was, how fragmented it was, how there were more types of schools than there were burgers and McDonald's. It was all of that kind of stuff that went on. And certainly the people from Scotland and the people from Wales and Northern Ireland all had things that they wanted to be critical about. Everybody had comments about things that hindered them but they were all proud of being part of the system. And one of the things that the Scottish people said, which I thought was really interesting, said comprehensive education is in our DNA, which is one of the things that I loved, that whole commitment to comprehensive education to try and meet the needs of all, all children within these children's community. And it was just, the other thing which was remarkable about it was they were saying that in Scotland, <coughs> it's such a small educational community and the conversations that people have and can have and the way that people can talk to each other. I think Jonathan's just been absolutely gobsmacked that as people come in, it's like, oh, hello, how are you doing? How are you? I'll get a hug. And, you know, it's all that stuff. That never happened with Michael Gove. I think it's fair <laughs> to say in English. Ne never, never. Not that, I'm, you know, not that I'm suggesting I am the Scottish equivalent of Michael Gove. <laughs> Far from it. Never entered my head. You know, I would say to somebody, though, it's like, moment of nostalgia. You know, I'm actually now missing David Cameron. You know, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm finding the Maybot even more scary than I found Cameron, and at least I could take the mickey out of him. So, yeah. So, anyway, that's a kind of long rambling way to say that Jonathan's come in from a very different system, but the other thing that you'll pick up on today, I'm sure, is that when we started that event, the Four Countries event, we asked people to talk about what mattered for them not as people from Northern Ireland, not as people from Scotland or wherever else, what mattered for them as professionals and teachers. And the thing that was hugely striking about it was there was instant consensus. And when we pulled together the comments that they were making, the ambitions that they had, the understandings that they had, the sense that they had of what would actually make a difference for young people, what they wanted to be involved in, what they wanted to be engaged in, absolutely replicated each other. And no matter which which country they came from, what their background was, what their level in, in the profession was, they suddenly all began to talk in the same language. And one of the things that came out of that is that good practice anywhere. When I go into a school in England, and I think it's a really good school, it's like the really good schools that I see in Scotland. It's like really good schools that I work in in Wales. The things that make schools different and make schools special aren't what's happening around and about them. That can get in the way or it can help or support. It's what is going on within them that makes that difference. Jonathan comes in from a background working in England. He's been in a school which is in a really difficult area. He may well tell you where it ranks in the realms of deprivation or whatever, but it's an outstanding school. It's a school that's really managed to turn things around. If you wanted to use the term closing the gap, it's a school that closed the gap. Um, and it's not been done by anything other, I think, than just some really good, effective practice that really looks at and addresses the needs of the young people that go there. And that's basically the story he's going to tell, with some monkey porn thrown in. OK, is that OK? <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Lear, welcome for him. Thank you. That was lovely. Um, I, it, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's, it's brilliant. I, I, I just want to reiterate, I am um, I'm an actual teacher. Uh, that's, I, and I work in a school, a proper school. With, we've got kids and everything. So the whole works. And um, it's in Sheffield. So I'm, I'm, I work in Sheffield. Uh, and it's a big inner city um, primary school in Sheffield. It's called St. Catharines. Uh, and I've been there a while. I think it's, uh, I've been there about eight, 19 years, I think, uh, since I started. Uh, I've not got out. And, um, and basically, I, I, well, I, yeah, I, I work there four days a week, and then I get let out a day a week to come and do stuff like this. It's like going on holiday. It's brilliant. Um, and, and what do I do? I want to talk to you about this. Um, and again, 
some of the, the stuff that Dave has mentioned there, this, uh, there'll be some kind of context to that, I suppose. But the first thing I want to do, really, is just to explain the, the guerrilla teaching thing and, and where it came from, because it, it needs to make sense, because it kind of underpins the whole session, really. Um, and, and to be honest, guerrilla teaching thing, it started for me... Um, well, actually, I think it was kind of uh, before I even went into teaching, if I'm totally honest, because um, like when I was at sixth form and everything, uh, I, I didn't want to be a teacher. Um, I wanted like a, you know, like a proper job that would like <laughs> decent money and everything and normal hours. Uh, and so I settled on being a, a physiotherapist. Uh, I wanted to be a physiotherapist. And so I went to sixth form college. That, that, that was my plan. So I picked my A-levels and everything you know, in, co in accordance with that. Like I was biology and chemistry and physics and stuff like that. Um, turned out they're quite hard subjects, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it was, it was pointed out to me that maybe uh, physiotherapy wasn't the right career path for me. <laughs> um, so I spent three years at sixth form redoing a couple of things. Um, and then uh, I'm not going to go into detail about what happened with my A-levels, but um, there's this thing called clearing. Uh, I went through clearing, which is uh, basically like, uh, it's like the, 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 the rescue valve for, for failures. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and it's what happens when you don't get into any of the universities you wanted to get into. Um, and it turned out at the time that actually the profession of teaching would accept anyone. You could, literally anyone, if you got like an F in general studies, you were embraced. Uh, and, you know, it's just fantastic. And I just, I thought, this is it. I mean, you know, I'd, my options were significantly narrowed, but I thought at least somebody wants me. <laughs> somebody wants me. And I just, I threw myself into it. I thought, actually, you know, I, teaching sounds great. Sounds fantastic. Uh, and I, I decided I'd find out a bit more about it. So I went back to my old primary school, uh, St. Edward's in Middlesbrough. So I'm from the Northeast originally. So I went back to my little primary school, asked if I could go in. And, and I watched this teacher. And it, it totally changed my view of it, actually. Because like I said, I've kind of fallen into it. But I watched this teacher in this classroom, Mrs. O'Connor. Mrs. O'Connor. And I watched her with these kids. And from that moment, I just thought, actually, this is incredible, this. This is, she's, she's changing the lives of these young people. It's a phenomenal thing that she's doing. And, and that's what I started to believe teaching was about. That's how I viewed it, this, like, world-changing profession. I thought, you know what, I'm actually going to go and make a difference. It's not going to be one of them jobs which is just, like, nine to five. It doesn't matter. I'm going to change the world here. And so I, I threw myself into my university course, Sheffield Hallam University. That's, they're the ones that had me. And, um, and I loved it. I just loved it. Did all my teaching practices, like, you know, like, full of enthusiasm that you get from students sometimes, full of enthusiasm. And then I got my first job at St. Catherine's. And as an NQT, I threw myself into it. But that real that buzz, I just couldn't wait to get going, couldn't wait to get started. Loads of excitement and everything. Um, and that was it. I started, started teaching NQT. It was brilliant. All of that enthusiasm. <laughs> I, oh, maybe two and a half weeks. <laughs> two and a half weeks. And then my world came crashing down around me. Because I realised that, that teaching is not like that. It's not this world changing thing where you make a difference. It's all fantastic, it's all excitement. It, it's hard work. <laughs> and there was, I had planning to do and, and assessments and marking and cutting around wooden letters for displays and, and, and wrangling with sticky back plastic because laminators haven't been invented. And all of that kind of stuff just took hours. And I just thought, God, actually, do you know what? This is, it's not about changing the world. It's about survival. It's about clinging on for dear life and surviving. And I was thinking as an NQT, to be honest, if I can get through my NQT year without physically harming children, <laughs> that's a result that, you know. <laughs> I know we've got, there's various ways of assessing NQT. It's all rubbish, you know. The kids are intact at the end of the year. You're all right. Um, and so, and that's what happened. I became very insular. I went back into my own little classroom and I just got on with it. I believed that to be the lot of the teacher. I just got to go listen to what I'm being told, get on with it, and hopefully I'll make a little bit of difference to the kids in front of me, whatever that means. They'll go out a little bit better than when they came in. That was it. And actually, this continued for a number of years, just kind of getting my head down, just getting on with it. But then there was stuff started happening, because I started teaching in England at a terrible moment, because they invented this thing called the, the National Frameworks, and there was this literacy framework and this numeracy framework, and they sent them into schools in these lunch boxes, loads of files and folders, and that was the year I started teaching. It's like Idiot's Guide to English and Maths. And then what happened after that? There was like, a, like an avalanche of supporting materials, and every single week there seemed to be something new coming into schools. And I can vividly remember sitting in a staff meeting as an NQT, where the people shared this experience, but sitting there as an NQT, like barely keeping my head above water, and then listening to this new thing that I had to go and do in my classroom, and feeling physically sick, you know, just feeling ill, just listening to it and thinking, oh. but what I do is just go, oh, yeah, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll go and do that, and I went back to my own little classroom, and 
I tried to do whatever it was, sort of the latest nonsense, or guided reading, something like that. I tried to do it, get on with it, and that was it. But then I'd go back the next week, and the same thing had happened again. I'd have that sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. There'd be something else thrown at me. It wasn't the head teacher's fault or the leadership fault because they were being bombarded with stuff as well. But it was just that time in education. Every week this happened. It just went on for ages. And it just got, it really got to me. I thought, this is just, this is not only am I having to kind of survive, but I'm being bombarded with all this extra stuff I have to try and do. But then about, about three or four years into my career, I had this like epiphany, this, this moment, which just totally changed things for me. And again, it was in a staff meeting. I can, again, vividly remember sitting there and listening to, to this other thing that I had to go and do in my classroom. But I can remember the thought that I had, and the thought was, actually, do you know what, that, that thing that I'm being asked to do, it's not going to make any difference to the children in my class. And so I just made a decision. I decided I would I'd just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I obviously pretended I was doing it. <laughs> I wasn't an idiot. <laughs> but I went back to my classroom, my own little classroom, and I just ignored it. And nothing bad happened. <laughs> nobody died, no big, ca no, it was unbelievable. But more than that, nobody noticed. <laughs> now, <laughs> there's a problem with that, isn't there? Because <laughs> actually, that's quite addictive. <laughs> you know, when you do something, get away with it once. You can't help but try it again, can you? So I was in the staff meeting the following week. I was a bit buoyed by this, sitting there, listening, something else. I had to go and do in my classroom. And like my face and my head was smiling and nodding. But in my brain, I was thinking, that's bollocks, that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I went back and ignored that as well. Got away with that. And before long, this became a, a, an ingrained pattern of behavior. Um, I was ignoring vast swathes of stuff that was supposedly being implemented across the school with, with the utmost of consistency. Not in year one. Oh, no. <laughs> and what I found, though, Actually, my children did really well. <laughs> they did really well, really well. And it wasn't for the, for the ones who I didn't want to be, I wasn't being lazy. But I think by that point, I got to the point where I, I understood what those children needed. And that's, like I say, when I became a little bit militant. Uh, and that's where the idea of good teaching came from, really. Because pr prior to that, I, I believed I had no control over it. I thought it was, you know, I just had to do what I was told to do. But all of a sudden, I was, I was monkeying around with stuff, and I quite like the feeling. Uh, this is actually what the dictionary definition of uh, the word gorilla is. I quite like this. It's what it says, look. Group of combatants using the element of surprise to harass a larger, <laughs> less mobile <laughs> 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 Can Because I, I want that. I knew, I knew I couldn't change things. I couldn't change the, the Department for Education. I couldn't change uh, what was going on in my own school. But I thought, if I can't change stuff, the very least I can do is make an absolute nuisance of myself. That is within my power as a teacher. And again, I felt quite good about this. And really, like I say, that's where it's come from. And I've had to maintain this sense of, of guerrilla-ness, if you like, because we've had all sorts thrown at us in our country. And uh, to be honest, it's, 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 over the last three or four years, it's just got worse and worse and worse. And, I, and I'm going to say this because it should cheer you up because it's nothing to do with you. But actually, last year was the worst year I've ever experienced in primary education. It was phenomenal in England because we had these idiots in charge of it all and there was all this assessment nonsense going on and, and nobody knew where they stood. It was phenomenal. We just we had no idea. And that made the head teacher and the leadership teams really nervous and anxious. And then the year six teams, getting those kids ready for the SATs, of which we had no idea how it was going to be measured, they were really anxious. And then everybody else was anxious. And there was like this gloom descended over the schools in England. It was phenomenal. Um, let me just show you just how bad things got. Um, actually, I'll, I'll, it's going to work the wrong way around, actually, because I want to show you first is something great. This is great, but it does highlight how bad things were. Um, the reason this is great is because this is, uh, this is something that happened in our school. Uh, this is a fish tank, and this fish tank was, it was sitting in our year four classroom. Year four classroom, so our kind of eight-year-olds, I suppose. Uh, it, and, and basically, they were involved in this project, this environmental project, where they were like um, raising brown trout, raising brown trout. And basically, we found this bloke with trout eggs, invited him into school, uh, checked he was safe and everything, invited him in, and, uh, and he worked with the year four children on this project, and he brought in a tank and everything, and they, they put the trout eggs into the gravel at the bottom of the tank, and they were going to kind of help, to, well, hopefully they'd hatch, and then look after them and feed them and everything, and then when they were big enough, release them into the River Don in Sheffield, like putting something back, ecological project, um, and they were just, oh, they absolutely loved it. 
from the moment he came in and, and talked about it, they were absolutely buzzing. Um, they were so excited, actually, when they put the trout eggs in the gravel, they named every single one of them. <laughs> That's the, the little bits of blue card around the outside. They're their names, all named individually. They were so excited. And I, I, I took a picture of it because I thought, do you know what, this, in the midst of all, all that nonsense going on, this is what education's about. This is the stuff we should be celebrating and sharing and shouting about. So I decided I'd, I'd tweet about it. Uh, this is my tweet, you can see just here. Year four at St. Catherine's, been hatching brown trout. This is Bob and Tina. Not long now until release date. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy to see, but Bob's on the left and Tina's <laughs> just, just over there at the right. Um, and I, you know what? Fantastic this. This is, this is it. This is, we should be shouting about this kind of stuff. The kids were absolutely loving it. But just literally as I tweeted it, there was something else popped up on my timeline in Twitter, which totally brought my mood crashing back down again. Um, there, there was a, a, a tweet from this woman here, Nikki Morgan, bless her. <laughs> now, she was our Secretary of State for Education. I would, uh, she's not anymore. I don't know where she is. I don't care. Um, but basically what happened was she tweeted. She, she took three minutes, 22 seconds out of her busy little life just to film a quick video to reassure us all about the whole assessment mess. And it was one of the most patronising things I've ever seen. It was phenomenal. She was basically saying, you just carry on with your lovely little teaching. Everything will be fine. And we knew that it wasn't going to be. Um, and it just really wound me up, really wound me up. I mean, I don't even know. I don't even know where she's filming it from. It looks like she's beaming it directly from the Death Star. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Where's that? It's just... It's from a place of darkness, complete darkness. It's unbelievable. And before I knew it, I tapped out a tweet about this. Um, and, and this is what the tweet said. Assurances about assessment from someone who doesn't understand the purpose of education. Misses the point. Because she absolutely doesn't. She hasn't got a clue about the purpose of education. Um, and that's all fine. That's all fine. Well, it would have been fine if I'd have stopped there. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a thought. <laughs> I had a thought. And my thought was, do you know what? Bob the Brown Trout would do a better job of running education than that woman. That was my thought. Because technically, he spent more time in a classroom. <laughs> Before I knew it, I tweeted it. <laughs> but more than that, I found out that on Twitter, you can set up a poll, can't you, like a survey. So I decided I'd just ask the educationists on Twitter who they'd rather have in charge of education. <laughs> Who would you rather have a Secretary of State for Education, Nikki or Bob? <laughs> this, was, uh, this was quite a popular poll on Twitter, this. <laughs> quite a lot of people responded. <laughs> what do you reckon the outcome was? <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Unanimous. 94% of the educationists wanted a fish in charge rather than a human. <laughs> now, some people are a little bit surprised that she actually got 6%. <laughs> uh, in this poll, that equates to just two votes, uh, which I think is possibly just Nikki voting for herself twice. I think that's how that played out. <laughs> but that's, that's the state of things in England. Like I said, I'm doing this to cheer you up. Uh, this, that's what it was like. We had absolutely no faith in the people running the system. Uh, and I absolutely, genuinely believe that the Department for England Education, they don't understand purpose of education. It's interesting that David talked about bringing those, those four countries together and the fact that actually... We do, as teachers, we know we've got a very clear purpose for education and vision for education. But for us in England, it was miles away from the messages we were getting. And I'm just going to share two words with you here. Um, uh, the idea of poiesis and praxis. And these come from uh, Aristotle, who, who used these terms to describe different domains in education. And he described poiesis as being the process of production. Now, now that's the system we've got in England. We've got a department for education who believe that children should be produced rather than educated. And then he also talked about this idea of praxis, bringing about goodness. And I love this phrase at the end, human flourishing. Human flourishing. Now, actually, when I talk to teachers in England, it's very clear where they're rooted. Department for education is up here, but teachers are, are here. This, this curriculum for excellence, it totally depressed me. Totally depressed me, right? Because this is bloody brilliant. This is brilliant, this thing. Because this is, this is rooted in praxis. This is rooted in human flourishing. It's rooted in all the things I would want for our curriculum, and, and it's there as a document. You have it. And it's been, I mean, I've, I did some work in Wales, in Cardiff, uh, and they've got, they've got a, they're kind of where they're in the early stages of it, but they've got a curriculum just like it, which I, 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 at first glance looks like they've pretty much just pinched yours. Uh, <laughs> it's actually kind of, I mean, you've got curriculum for excellence. 
There's his curriculum for Wales. <laughs> so, <laughs> a little bit unimaginative, um, but it is Wales. So, um, <laughs> there was so much in here that jumped out at me when I looked through that document. But I suppose essentially, it, it's just a document. And curriculum's more than that. Uh, it's more important than that. Um, I'm just going to share with you this little quote here. Ken Robinson, I like this one. Because again, I, I just find it massively empowering. If you can change what's happening at the ground, then you've changed the world. Um, one of the other things he said in the same little speech was, was what would happen if you went up to one of your children in your schools and asked them what the education system was? What would their response be? Now, I know this because I've tested it out with kids at St. Catherine. And they look a bit confused to begin with, but then they all give the same answer. They just look up at you and they go, do you miss? They're called miss now, 18 years consecutively. <laughs> <laughs> Never correct. <laughs> We're it. They don't actually see anything beyond us. They don't see documentation. They don't see a curriculum map or a plan or, or policy. They see us. We, we are education to those young people in front of us. And that gives us incredible power, I think, actually, even as individual teachers in classrooms or, or small schools or even big schools. Um, we are in a position to change things, to make things different, to make things better. Um, in terms of changing things, making things better, essentially what we do as schools and as organisations is, is to work creatively. Whatever it is we've got to work on, we have to take it and we have to make it work for our communities. Uh, and like I say, that means working creatively. And, and for us, the context that I'm in in England, it means having to work very, very creatively because what we've got is utter crap. That curriculum, it's no fun at all. We've got every preceding every single statement in that curriculum, it has the words, children should be taught to. Because that is the only way. That is the only way. And then I read your document. Like I say, that's why it depressed me. So you've got a much better starting point. But it's just a document, I suppose. What it needs is people on the ground to take it and to turn it into something that, that is fit for purpose, something that does work, something that does transform. Um, this, this actually, this could have been lifted from that document, that curriculum for excellence document. Um, this, it isn't. This has come from something called the PLTS. Because we had some good ideas a while ago in England, about 10 years ago. We had this idea, good idea, about the fact that it wasn't enough for our school leavers to leave just knowing stuff. They needed competency, skills as well. So when we had somebody called Professor Mick Waters in charge of the QCA, and they produced this document called the PLTS, the Personal Learning and Thinking Skills Framework. And lots of those capacities, or elements of those capacities, they're, they're very, very similar to some of those areas on that skills grid, if you like. Um, uh, this is one of them, the idea of creative thinking. And actually, uh, two out of the four capacities very, very strongly link with this idea of thinking creatively, or thinking critically, solving problems, overcoming barriers. Lots of these points on here. And the reason why I'm showing it here is because actually, certainly for me in my context, this is something that jumped out at me as being massively important. I mean, I'm, I'm talking now in the backdrop of this, <laughs> which is talking about why creativity is important to employers. And it is, because they want literate and numerate workers, but they also want people who can think. People who can ask questions and generate ideas, adapt, overcome barriers. Because those things are the things that, that make you an effective person, I suppose, not just a worker. Um, and I suppose when I first saw this, I mean, this was written for children. It was written for school leavers. But it struck me that actually it's, this is just as important for, for teachers, for leaders in schools as well. Because actually, if you think about the way we operate in the main, if we want children to develop a certain thing or to learn something, what we usually do is model it for them in some way. Some kind of concept in maths, we'll model it, we'll let them practice and apply it. This is no different, is it? If we want our children to develop this kind of thinking, we have to be actively modelling it ourselves. I mean, for me, that's actually one of the main reasons why we aspire or should aspire to be creative teachers, to have creative curriculum, to be creative schools. It's not just because of the engagement and the motivation aspects. It's because in doing so, we're actively modelling that kind of thinking. And that gives us a starting point, doesn't it? Now, it, it's not enough, because obviously, if we model it for the children, we then have to give them the opportunity to develop it too. And that, that I think, is the difficult bit. So how do we actually get children thinking like this? How do we send them from our schools, as school leavers, with that stuff firmly embedded? And really, that's what I want to kind of explore a little bit today, because I don't actually think that's to do with curriculum. I think it's to do with teachers. And to just explain it without thinking, I, I want to tell you a story. And the story, it's about, um, well, quite a specific kind of monkey, a capuchin monkey. And I don't want to, you know, you might be well up on your monkey knowledge up here in Edinburgh, I don't know. Um, so I don't want to presume you don't know anything. But essentially, capuchin monkeys are supposedly the most intelligent 
troop of monkeys on the planet. Highly intelligent. They can do all sorts. They can like use tools and, and use rocks and stuff to break things open, problem solve, all that kind of stuff. Brilliant. Um, and the only reason I know anything about them, to be honest, is, uh, is because of my daughters. I've got two girls. I've got three children all together. Uh, but I've got two girls, two older girls, and I've got little Reuben, 15 months. Uh, now, Eve and Emmy, Eve, my eldest, when she was in year three, um, she came home from school really, really excited because she'd found out from Miss Burke, the teacher, that they were doing this topic on the rainforest, Amazon rainforest. And she was your classic year three girl, Eve. You know, like just full of it, loved school, loved a teacher, just wanted to do as much as possible to please her, basically. Um, and so she came rushing home, tell me about it, full of it. And she wanted to basically find out some information about the rainforest. So she'd go back into school for show and tell later in the week and just like show off a little bit to a teacher, basically. Um, and I, I wanted to help her, you know, as a dad and everything. Uh, and as luck would have it, I was uh, flicking through the planner on Sky, just looking through the program list. Uh, and I noticed this program called Wild Brazil, documentary, hour-long documentary called Wild Brazil, which was basically set in the Amazon rainforest. So these scientists, they'd filmed these capuchin monkeys for an entire season in the Amazon rainforest. So I recorded it immediately. So this is just perfect, this. And I told Eve about it, and she was just oh, dead excited. So she shot off upstairs, got herself a little notepad and pen. Already take loads of notes and everything, but that's brilliant. And then I had Imogen, who was about five at the time, told her about it. Not in the least bit bothered. Not in the least bit bothered. Uh, but I thought, I'm having you, because it's an hour where you'll sit still on the sofa with me. You won't be bouncing around the house like normal. So I had them both there, ready. Eve on this side, notepad and pen. Eve here, in my ear, wriggling away. Put it on, press play, hour long documentary, peace and quiet for an hour, it's going to be perfect. It started going wrong about two minutes in, I would say, because what unfolded in this documentary was, was probably the most gratuitous monkey sex I have ever seen. <laughs> <sighs> we, you know, I mean, we are talking full on, high intensity <laughs> monkey sex. And it's there, you're talking widescreen, full HD. <laughs> this is, um, so I've got, e, she's furiously scribbling notes. <laughs> furiously. <laughs> Note taking over on this side. Imogen, up until two minutes ago, not bothered in the slightest, now she is glued to the screen. <laughs> glued to it. And this is, and, uh, you know, I d this is not, I don't want to be in this position. I am highly uncomfortable in this moment. You know, I'm a good Catholic lad. It's not a conversation I want with my girls at any point in their lives. You need to be clear about that. And then, then the questions come, don't they? Because she's five and she can't help herself. And she's interested all of a sudden. She goes, Daddy, what are they doing? What are they doing there? What are they doing? What are those monkeys? Why are they making that noise? What's happening? <laughs> And I did, oh, I did what most dads, I think, would do in that situation. Under that level of pressure, I just lied about what was happening. I just I made up excuses about the goings on. I just said, oh, they're just, they're just chasing each other. Just a bit of chase. Game of chase. That's all. That's all. They're just having a play with each other. That's all. Having a play. Um, I mean, which technically was half true. Uh, <laughs> just, you know. And this, but you get desperate, don't you? Because you know what they're like. They keep coming with the questions and everything. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a very vigorous piggyback. That's all. It's very vigorous. <laughs> Biggie back. I'm just going to let that image sink in for a minute. Just, uh, just make sure that's right at the forefront of your mind. Uh, and this kind of, this, oh, and it was, it kept going, they kept going. It was for, it's incredible stamina. You have to take your hat off to them. <laughs> to be honest, it was impressive. Um, and what I couldn't, I mean, I know what you're thinking. Why don't you just turn it off? Just turn it off. But I, I couldn't turn it off because in between, like, the, the bursts of monkey porn, there were these brilliant, like, snippets of information about the rainforest. You know, there was good information there. I don't know how Eve was differentiating between <laughs> the two lot. I mean, you imagine show and tell in that classroom later in that week with a, yeah, yeah guess what my dad showed me? <laughs> Brilliant. Could have cost Miss Burke a job. Um, and so we kind of persevered with it. I kept fobbing Imogen off and everything. And, and it kind of got to about 45 minutes in and, and they're still going, the monkeys, unbelievable. Um, mating season lasts for about six months and they were still going. But 45 minutes, the documentary seemed to be finishing, coming to an end. And I couldn't work it out because I knew it was an hour long show. Um, but then it went into one of those, um, you, you get them sometimes in documentaries, like a behind the scenes, this is how we made it section. And, uh, and that's what happened. And basically what the scientists decided to do was to test out the intelligence of these monkeys. They wanted to just see how clever they actually were. And so what they did was they created this special box, this, uh, well, like a monkey proof box. And it was this reinforced box and it had like nuts inside, which was their favorite food. Um, but to get the nuts out, there were these two things on the front. There was a lever and a chute. And to get the nuts out, they had to press the lever down, and then the nuts rolled out of the chute. That was it. 
Now, the monkeys, they, they'd never come across a lever before in their natural environment. It was totally new to them, totally new. They could use other things, but totally new. And they just left it in the jungle clearing, and then they went back to their hidden cameras, film what happened next. And it was just, it was fascinating. Fascinating, because quite quickly, the monkeys, the troop of monkeys just descended on the box, because it was new and they were curious about it. Um, and they started kind of like, tentatively at first, just, you know, like playing out some learned behaviours. So they went up and a bit of a sniff and a nibble and kind of bashed at it a bit, walked round. A couple climbed up on top, tried kind of hammering through the top of it, trying to get through, that wasn't working. Uh, some others poking at it with sticks. Uh, some, one of them tried a stone, getting in with a stone, that wasn't working. Um, there was one monkey, actually, he didn't even, uh, he didn't even go up to the box. He, he stood a bit of a, a distance away like this. And his only strategy for getting to the nuts was, was just to re repeatedly throw poo at it, just over and over. That was, <laughs> was all that was happening. And the other monkeys, after a while, they slowly, in kind of twos and threes, they, they drifted off back into the, in the jungle. And then the box was kind of left on its own again. And then there was another monkey on the other side, just, just here. And uh, <laughs> he'd, <laughs> he'd, just been, he'd just been sat watching, watching it all. He's a bit cocky, he was. <laughs> <laughs> just sat watching and he waited till all the others had gone and then he walked over he walked over to the box himself and he did what some of the other monkeys had done he, he kind of he walked around it a little bit first had a bit of a sniff and a poke climbed on top tried kind of banging through the lid and everything wasn't working and then he climbed down in front and you could see him like looking at these things sticking out and again quite slowly he had a bit of a poke around and everything and sniffed it and nibbled it prodded it um, and then after a while he, he put his paw <coughs> on on the leaf a bit and he noticed that it moved, just a, a tiny amount, noticed that it moved a little bit. And it, he was interested in that. So he put a little bit more pressure on it, moved a little bit more. A little bit more pressure until he'd moved it enough, and then the nuts came rolling down the chute. Now, he couldn't believe his luck. So he had a quick look round, checked nobody was looking. And then he ate the nuts. And then he pressed it again, more came out, and he ate some more. Pressed it again, ate some more, pressed it again, ate some more. And then he walked off. And I thought, oh, he's, he's obviously had enough, had enough. But he hadn't. He, he went off and he got his friend. The one who'd been throwing the poo. <laughs> he brought him over and he stood him in front of the box and he said, Now, just have a look at this. It's obviously my interpretation of the conversation. <laughs> so that's, uh, and he showed him what he'd done. And he, he, he put his paw on the leaf and he pressed it down. His friend was watching him. And the nuts came out of the sheet. His, his friend was blown away. He couldn't believe it. And he, he learned from the first monkey and he did the same thing. He pressed the lever down and the nuts came out of the chute. He had enough. Before long, the rest of the monkeys have descended back around the box. They're all jostling for space at the front, trying to use this lever, trying to learn from the monkey before them, use the lever, get the nuts out. It was unbelievable. Um, and the thing that struck me was actually a, a quote that the scientists use. Um, this is what they said. This was their way of kind of summing up the success of this troop of monkeys. They said they had insatiable curiosity and the ability to learn from each other. And that hit me straight away, on, on two levels, actually. First as a parent, uh, and then also as a, as a teacher, as an educator. Um, as a parent, it immediately made me think about Imogen, five years old, because she could easily be described like that. I mean, in fact, she, she'd made my life hell for 45 minutes because of that, that incessant questioning. She just kept going and going. And then I thought about what I'd done, my response to that, which was essentially just to shut her down, because I was a bit uncomfortable about it all. And then I thought about other times when the questions had come. And you might know this if you've got your own five-year-old. You know, like going on a car journey with a five-year-old. It's painful. It's painful because you just try to drive and get somewhere. But then they sit in the back and they notice something. And then that gets turned very quickly into a question. One of the classics we had from Imogen was, Daddy, what, what would happen if the road disappeared? <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's, uh, your natural reaction as a parent is just to, to like, appease. You go, oh, you don't need to worry. That can't happen. You don't need to worry. It can't happen. Yes, but what if it did? And then they just keep going at you until they get a response they're happy with, which is actually never. And that's what it's like. And I thought, actually, that's an incredible thing, that. I should be, I should be nurturing that as a parent. I shouldn't be fobbing her off and, and trying to stop the questions. And that then made me think about the kids in school. Because I started as a, as a year one teacher teaching five-year-olds, and I loved it because they were like that. And then I got moved against my will to teach the 10 and 11-year-olds in year six. And they weren't like that. Actually, for those children, the questions had dried up. They didn't have the same insatiable curiosity. They couldn't be described like that. They were engaged in school and everything, and they enjoyed learning, and they were curious about things, but not to the same degree as, as a five-year-old. And then that just depressed me, because I thought, God, is that just inevitable for Imogen? Is she going to grow up 10, 11, and then it will just stop and dry up? <coughs> I mean, I've spoken to secondary colleagues about children who hit 14, 15, it's not necessarily about eliciting a, a question from those children. It's about getting anything beyond like a grunt. That would be good. Um, 
And so you've got this kind of trajectory of, of, of loss of natural curiosity. Um, and then I suppose I started thinking about the stuff that goes on in schools, not just the children, but the stuff that goes on. And that brought me back to what had gone on in the jungle clearing. And I became much more interested in not the monkeys, but the scientists and what the scientists had done. Because essentially, if you think purely in terms of outcome, the outcome of that little experiment was the monkeys ate the nuts. That's what happened. At the end, the monkeys ate the nuts. That was the outcome. And those scientists, they could have got to that outcome in a much more straightforward way. They could have just got some nuts, put them on a plate, and then put the plate on the jungle clearing, and then step back. And the monkeys would have rolled up to the plate, eaten the nuts quite happily, <coughs> then gone off home again. That would have been it. Same outcome achieved. But they didn't do that. They set out to make life deliberately difficult for those monkeys. They created awkwardness. And it was actually the conditions that the scientists created that pushed the monkeys into that kind of thinking. And that kind of fascinated me that, that actually it wasn't a natural thing for the monkeys to have done. It only came about because of the conditions created. I mean, this is, uh, this is what our curriculum looks like. And to be honest, it could be what any curriculum looks like. Because with any curriculum, I don't care how well written it is, how well thought out it is, what you will end up with ultimately is a, there is content, there is knowledge there because there has to be. And as soon as there's knowledge and content there, then there are decisions to be made as teachers and schools. And I suppose one of those decisions that's made or can be made is that very, very straightforward route, I suppose. This could easily be nuts on a plate because actually it certainly is in England. Children should be taught too is nuts on a plate. They roll up at school, we feed them the nuts, we assess them, obviously, and then we send them off home again. Not particularly happy. Nuts on a plate. And like I say, it doesn't matter how well a curriculum's written. It's the teachers, I suppose, isn't it, that decide how this, how this goes, how this happens. Um, and the nuts on a plate, it's, it, it, it can't be ever enough because it certainly won't create the right conditions that would push those children into different kinds of thinking. It's up to us to create those conditions. Even creative teaching is no good. Because creative teaching essentially is just adding sparkle to that. It's still nuts on a plate, but just looks better. It's a bit shinier. Kids enjoy it more. They're engaged and motivated, which are good things. But even that, even being the most creative teacher in the world or the most creative school in the world, is still not enough because that's about our creativity and not about the creativity of the children. So how do we get to that? And that's what I became more interested in. This, this is a, as a model, this, this can't work. We can't just have that nuts on a plate. What we need is, is something more like this. And again, this kind of curriculum, this kind of monkey curriculum, this, this I think, reflects the curriculum for excellence. So I mean, this would have been a better name for the Wales curriculum, certainly. Uh, <laughs> this is what they should have gone for. <laughs> should have marketed it. But essentially, it's got it, knowledge is there because nobody's trying to get away from knowledge. We know it's important, and we know we need it in there. Um, but then we've also got the ability to make connections, to collaborate, to question, because those things are as important, if not more important, than just knowing stuff. We need balance. That's what we need. And like I say, that balance doesn't need to come from curriculum. It needs to come from teachers. Um, what I decided to do, I decided I, was, I, I wanted to explore this a little bit more because there was no doubt in my mind that the monkeys in that jungle had been pushed into this kind of thinking, thanks to the conditions the scientists created. Um, so really, what I was interested in is whether or not that would work with children. Could I replicate the same kind of conditions and see whether or not it pushed children into that kind of thinking in a school? Um, and obviously, I didn't have monkeys. I had, I had children. Um, but I, obviously, the most monkey-like children we have in our school system live in foundation stage and down there with the four-year-olds and the five-year-olds. They're our kind of monkey-like thinkers in the very best sense of the word. So that's what I decided to do, to go down and, and try a little monkey-proof box experiment with our four-year-olds to see what went on. The other thing I didn't have, other than the monkeys, was, was a rainforest clearing. Um, but I did have the next best thing at St. Catherine's. I had a mud kitchen. Now, you're aware of mud kitchens, aren't you? You know about mud kitchens. Yes? Well, if you don't, a mud kitchen is essentially a place, generally in a foundation stage with the four-year-olds, uh, which is like an outdoor kitchen, except it's got mud in it. And so they make mud pies and mud soup, and they get filthy and wet. It's just fantastic. Um, if you don't have a mud kitchen in Sheffield, you're like a social outcast. You just have to. It's one that's very fashionable at the moment. Um, <laughs> and this is what the mud kitchen at St. Catherine's looks like. Uh, there you go. You can see this is uh, it's kind of outdoor St. Catherine's. There you go. And if you are, you know, if you're a bit of a mud kitchen expert, a bit of an aficionado, you might spot one or two problems with this being an effective mud kitchen. Well, you can see that. It is, it's, it's built entirely on concrete. 
There is absolutely no mud. And this is because we're, we're an inner city school. We're kind of hemmed in by houses. And the foundation stage, outdoor space, is just a big concrete rectangle. That's it. But the teachers, they were bright sparks. They decided to get around this problem by basically shipping mud in from wherever it came from, like the countryside or something. And <laughs> <laughs> they were going to basically just, like, you know, like store it in stacked up tyres. A few stacked up tyres filled with soil, some more stacked up tyres filled with like bark chippings, and some more again with little stones and stuff. And the kids could just scoop out, make their mud pies, and it'll all be brilliant. And so this, this was the location for my research. So I was going to leave my little problem, my little bit of awkwardness, in the mud kitchen, stand back, and just see how the children responded. But I never got to do it. And the reason I never got to do it is because there was a fight broke out on the foundation stage yard between the two foundation stage teachers. Teachers of these four-year-olds at a full-on fight. Now, the fight, this is going to sound ridiculous, but you need to bear with me. The fight was over a tap, an outdoor tap. Now, as well as having no mud at St. Catharines, we also had no outdoor water. I don't know why we thought it was a good idea to build a mud kitchen. But no outdoor water, no mud. And so they were having to decide where the outdoor tap should go. And that essentially is what the fight was about. They couldn't agree on it. Now, I'm going to zoom in in a minute here, because if you look closely, you can see a tap already there. Can you see that? Just, oh, can you all see the bloke kneeling down at the back? <laughs> now, he's not actually that important to the story. That's just Bradley the builder, just finishing off. That's all. He's just finishing off. Um, but here, there is a tap. Now, this is important, this, because this is, this is a fake tap. Now, technically, it's a real tap, but it just doesn't work. So Bradley, the builder, he found it in the back of his van, and he just thought he'd screw it on. <laughs> just, he was being helpful. Um, but he thought the kids could play with it, like a play tap. Pretend to turn it on, pretend to turn it off. Nothing comes out, just a play tap, that's all. Um, he stuck it on. And you can see where it is. It's on the bench at the back. There's a little bowl being recessed just underneath it. Over there, you can see there's other bowls there. And they were thinking they'd put some hooks on the back fence hang up all the pans and utensils so the kids can make their mud pies independently, all be brilliant. And that's where the first teacher wanted it. She said, well, hang on a minute, how, how daft, how daft is that having a fake tap there? Why don't we just get him to plumb that in? Why don't we get him to make that the working tap? <coughs> then they can come in, they can turn it on, all the pans will be there, make the mud pies, brilliant, that's where it should be. The other teacher, though, she was adamant that it should go somewhere else. She didn't even want it in the mud kitchen. She wanted it on the other side of, of the partition. Other side of the, it's um, a little bit easier to see on the overhead plan. There you go. I've <laughs> gone to quite a lot of trouble here. First teacher, there you go. That's where she wanted it, in the mud kitchen, on the worktop where the bowls are. There. Other teacher, though, teacher B, no way. She wanted it on the other side of that partition, just over there on that back fence. That's where she wanted it. That's why they took 30 minutes of their lives. This fight, that's what it took. Where would you put it? Where would you put the tap? and why. Have a quick talk to the people around you. Where would you put the tap and why? <laughs> okay, let me just stop you there for a second. Now, I've got two options here. Option A, option B. Um, and what we're going to do is keep things interesting. We're going to have a vote. We'll have a vote. You can tell me what you think. Um, if you're sitting there thinking, I couldn't give a toss where this tap goes. <laughs> What I'd like you to do is just humour me. Go for one of the two options, option A, option B. Okay? So, first of all, uh, option A. Tap in position A. That's it, go on, put your hands up. Fantastic, that's all right. And then option B. So, I would say that's pretty even split, I think, between A and B. Yeah? Pretty even split. So, those people who put their hands up for A, first of all, tell me about your reasoning behind A. <laughs> that's where... <laughs> that's where the kitchen is. We're, rep we're trying to replicate a real kitchen here. Common sense dictates you should stick the tap in there because the kids will go in, expect to find a working tap, get water out, brilliant. Yes, common sense, fantastic. So then, if, if A is the common sense approach, that must mean by default that B is, is something else. Uh, so uh, tell me about your reasoning for B then. What, why B? Because again, half the room went B. You to wash out how to get the water yeah. from, from B to A. So, say that again, sorry. Kids have to work out how to get the water. From, from the kitchen. So if they want the, the water in the mud kitchen, they're going to have to work out how to move it. So there's going to be like a, a transportation issue. Yes? Uh, now, th again, <laughs> is that, are you giving a reason for having it in position B or A? I'm, I'm for A for the health and safety You want it in A for health and safety reasons? <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Can we have her escorted out? Can she? <laughs> 
you, uh, there is, you are containing, I suppose, aren't you? You're containing the, the, water, the spread of water, which means that you're not ending up with a slippy floor all over the place. So, no, I totally take your point. Again, it, it, I think it's that common sense answer, isn't it? Yeah, it keeps things kind of nice and safe and contained and stuff like that. Putting it in B, uh, it could spread everywhere. It could spread everywhere, couldn't it? Um, but also, there is that issue of, of having to, to move it to transport it. Now, I will tell you which one they went for. They, they went for position B in the end. And it was for exactly the reason that you gave. So they knew that putting it there would force the children into having to transport the water. And they viewed that as being a desirable difficulty. Uh, it is awkward, because like I say, that's predominantly where they'll be working. But let's force them to think about how they're going to move it, a desirable difficulty. And again, if we go back to the, the scientists and the monkey proof box in that jungle clearing, if we ask them the same question, there's only one place they put the tap, following that same train of thought. They would put it there as well, a layer of desirable difficulty. Um, and so that's what happened. That's where they decided to put the tap. Um, but the argument didn't stop there, because when they settled on the position of the tap, they then argued about the type of tap. No, no, no. Oh, this is th 30 minutes of their lives. And they had, there was three options they had. Three options. They had this one, which was like traditional garden tap. So kind of turn on, turn off, just like that. Um, this one, this had a button on the side. And you press the button in, and water comes out the bottom. You take your finger off the button, and the water stops. And then they had this one with a large lever, which you kind of turn on and then turn off, just like that. Three options. And there is absolutely no right and wrong to this at all. There's very good reasons why you could have any one of these three taps. So, which tap would you choose <laughs> and why? Go on, quick chat about it. Which tap and why? <laughs> OK, let me stop you there. Um, so, again, three options this time. Did the voting. That went very well last time. So. We'll do the same thing again. Um, any people for uh, tap A? Tap A, any takers? Tap A? Yeah, hands up. Brilliant. Tap B? Tap C? So, uh, yeah, I would say the majority for B, but then certainly a fairly even split between A and C, I would say, yeah? Uh, so, first of all, those people who went for tap A, tell me about tap A. Um, awkward. Yeah, it's more awkward. It's harder for the children to turn it. They've got to improve the dexterity to turn it on and off. Fantastic. So, uh, again, with that uh, kind of thinking around uh, potentially a desirable difficulty, then, yes, the, the fine motor involved in manipulating that tap might be a very good reason to choose it, definitely. Um, so, yes, I like that. Fantastic. <coughs> what about B? Tell me about B. I think you might have to work together to get the amount of water that you'd want for that one, so it might increase collaboration also in a sustainable environment, that's yeah. what desired yeah. also. Okay. So th there's two things going on there. There's conservation of water. So if you take your finger off, the water will stop, which is so it's not going to flood things. Um, I mean, potentially, you're, you're not teaching them a great lesson there uh, in terms of you walk away from a tap and it just stops, because not all taps are like that. But definitely would do that. But then also the thought about potentially almost kind of forcing children into collaboration. Uh, maybe it would be an awkward one to use. Um, OK. Uh, and what about tap C? I thought kids would like it. The lever action. The, yeah. You quite, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the tap for you. <laughs> yeah, but it's something, it's nice, you know, it's a nice thing to get hold of, isn't it? Yeah, no, no, I like that. It's, it has, it's got, it's, a, it's an easy handle to operate. Um, and again, I suppose you could go down the route of uh, inclusion and stuff like that. You know, if you had a child with any level of physical disability, it might be the only tap to go for. Very easy to operate. Um, I suppose one of the added advantages of both A and C is that you can, you can regulate the flow, can't you? You can turn it on a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, I mean, you'll also know that if, you've, if you ever work with four-year-olds, that's absolutely irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> you know, see, they're off or it's full on. See, there's no, no grey areas. Um, now, like I say, there is no right and wrong to this. I will tell you which tap they went for on the end. And somebody has hit upon the reason why. Uh, and the tap they went for was tap B. That's what they went for. And they had the same thought that you did, I think. They, had that th they imagined a child going up to it, trying to fill a container with that tap. And to begin with, they thought, it might, well, it might be all right. You could hold your pan, your container with one hand, press the button with the other, fine. But then as any amount of water kind of got into it and it got heavy, it might get awkward. And they thought that that might force the child into roping in a friend. Just come over here, just stick your finger on that. Force collaboration. And they viewed that as another layer of desirable difficulty. So we'll put this tap in a slightly awkward position. We'll make it a slightly awkward tap to use on your own. And then we'll see what happens. And this is what it looked like. There you go, you can see on the plan, it was that tap in that position. And all it had to do now, really, was come up with a reason for the kids to use it. Um, and, and that happened with a letter. And the letter was from the king. Uh, the king who lives on the hill. You know, yeah, we know him, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and the kids knew him, too, because he was always writing to them. <laughs> Forever writing them letters. It was incessant. And 
He wrote them a letter whenever he got himself into a spot of bother. He was in a bit of trouble, and he wrote to the kids because they were the ones who would always help him out. And, and one morning, well, basically, the, the teachers, they'd been at it the weekend, aren't they, with the, the brown paper and the tea bags and everything. Do you know what I mean? Making this nice uh, aged paper. And they'd wrapped it up with a bit of ribbon and left it on this cushion on the carpet for the kids to come in and discover. And the kids came in on a morning, these four-year-olds, and they were dead excited about this, obviously. They wanted to know what, it, what was going on, what was happening. The teachers obviously denied all knowledge of it. They lied to them, didn't they? They go, never seen it before. So just, it was here when I got here this morning. And they forced the teachers to read it. The teacher opened it up, read the letter. And she said, oh, it's, it's from the king. And they all went, yes, come on, yes. And they started to read. And it said, dear children, dear children, I seem to have found myself in a spot of trouble yet again. And they all went, oh. He's <laughs> always doing that. <laughs> I've forgotten the queen's birthday. Now, at that moment, there was a sharp intake of breath across foundations. They all went, <laughs> because they knew this was bad. They knew the king. He was lovely. Always nice to them, really nice to them. But they'd also had dealings with the Queen. And they knew she was an absolute bitch. <laughs> they hated her. <laughs> so they knew it was bad. The King, though, he had a plan. And his plan was, basically, he decided, he told the children, that if he could put together, if he could throw a surprise banquet for the Queen, she would never know that he'd forgotten in the first place. But obviously, if you're a king, you can't just throw a surprise banquet just like that. You need a significant amount of help. And he was wondering whether or not the children would be up for it. They were like, yes, of course, we'll help. We'll help. We hate the queen. We'll help you. It's fine. And he was dead helpful in his letter because he gave quite a specific list of dietary requirements for the queen. <laughs> All mud-related products. <laughs> so, mud pie, mud soup, mud pizzas, mud sausages, pretty much mud everything. And the, the kid, they were desperate to get out into that mud kitchen to help the king out. There was a bit of a rush on, a bit of a rush job, uh, but they wanted to get out there. And so they did. They got out there into the mud kitchen. But when they got outside, they found out that something terrible had happened. And somebody, we don't know who, had taken all of their pots and pans and divided them into two groups. Someone had taken half the pots and pans and they'd fastened them all to the kitchen worktop area with cable ties so they couldn't be removed. Half the pots and pans in there, all fast with cable ties. Can't take them away, can't move them, nothing. And then they'd taken the other half of the pots and pans, all of the loose ones, and drilled holes in the bottom of them all. Now, that's borderline vindictive. <laughs> Don't do that to a four-year-old. Got all these pans loose. Don't hold water. All the other pans, non-holy ones, they're all strapped into the mud kitchen with cable ties. And if you're four and you can cut your way through a cable tie, you're welcome to those pants. Do you know what I mean? It's a, you can have them. <laughs> what do you reckon they did? Now, if that was us in that position. There's only one reaction. We, we'd be in a corner crying, wouldn't we, as adults? But not those four-year-olds. What do you reckon they did? How do you reckon they responded? So, well, is it, sorry? They got wet. That's absolutely what happened. I mean, they didn't, even, they didn't even go to the pants to begin with. They ignored the pants, the ones on the floor. They went straight over to the tap. Come on. <laughs> Let's get it done. Let's get it done. <laughs> they had their hands underneath, and they got their friend to press the button, forced collaboration. And their hands filled up with water, and they were dead pleased with that. And then they ran. <laughs> <laughs> and they got halfway, and they were, there was no water in their hands anymore. They, were, they looked down, their trousers were covered with water. They were soaking wet. They thought it was hilarious. thought it was hilarious. So what did they do next? Think like a four-year-old. They did it again, yes. <laughs> they did exactly the same thing again. Again, and they ran for the second time, and they were still soaking. I think that was even funnier. Um, and then they kind of diversified in their thinking a little bit. Some of them ended up in threes, little threes. And you had one with their hands under the tap like that, one pressing the button. And then the third child catching the drips <laughs> underneath. And they walked in unison. <laughs> Occasionally stopping to top up from underneath. It was incredible. Um, it didn't get them that much further, <laughs> actually, but they liked it. And then they started to go back to the pans that were on the floor, and they noticed them, and they picked them up, and they had a bit of a play around with them. And they started to do some fairly, I suppose, kind of obvious things, like trying to block the holes. Uh, there was one child, actually. He decided he would put the soil in first and then go to the tap. I like that. Uh, and he did. He went over there. But, I mean, I told you about to ship in soil. Essentially, it was from a, a garden centre. It was like compost. So it was rubbish. So he went up to the water and it kind of drained through. Um, if it had been clay, it would have been perfect, wouldn't it? So that kind of didn't work. Some others tried to put, like, stones in and leaves and kind of layer the pan and stuff like that. Uh, there was one little boy, Bright Spark. He went straight back into the foundation stage classroom. 
And he got himself a handful of, well, of possibly the greatest teaching resource known to mankind. He brought it back out with him. I'm talking about paper towels. <laughs> paper towels. Because he'd been watching his teacher closely, and he knew that a wet paper towel fixed anything. <laughs> Shall we? A broken arm, put a wet paper towel on it, be all right. <laughs> be fine, don't need to ring mum, it's all right. <laughs> layered his pan with these paper towels and they got wet but then they, they kind of clogged the holes and he was pleased with that but the wetter they got then they started to disintegrate a little bit and let the water through and he kind of gave up on that um, and there was numerous other solutions uh, one child two pans one pan inside the other rotated slightly so it kind of misaligned the whole four years old four years old um, but there was two solutions that I'm going to share with you that I just loved um, and this was two little girls two little girls working with each other and they were friends but also kind of, I suppose, that idea of forced collaboration, they kind of had to to operate the tap. And this first solution, I really like this, the first solution was a sponge. And the main reason I really like this is because this is clearly based on a piece of knowledge, isn't it? This little girl knows something. And this is why we're, we're never trying to get away from knowledge, because actually you can't be creative if you've got nothing to think creatively about. And, and she knew about the properties because she'd learned it or been taught it or discovered it, but she knew. And she walked all the way down to the foundation stage classroom, into the wet area, uh, into the area where there was a kind of a water tank and everything and then there was all these baskets and there was a basket full of sponges that they used for printing and art and she got the biggest one that she could find she came back out and she stood with a friend at the tap pressed the button water started to soak into the sponge and, and it was dripping and everything but it felt quite heavy it felt like they had quite a bit of water in it and so they carried it carefully around into the mud kitchen squeezed it out into one of the bowls and then went back repeated it two three times each time getting a little bit more into the bowl uh, but on the fourth occasion, they got a little bit disheartened with it. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why, but what they said was, not as much is going in. Not as much is going in. Um, whether they thought it was kind of because it was already wet, it wasn't holding us, I don't know, but they kind of gave up on it. Um, and then th that's kind of when the first incredible thing happened. This, the little girl, she, she took hold of that sponge and she walked all the way back down the yard, back into the foundation stage classroom, into the wet area where the water tray was and all of the baskets. And she put the sponge back into the basket that was labelled sponges. Now, I've worked 15 years with 10-year-olds. <laughs> I don't know whether I've witnessed that. It's, <laughs> it's a phenomenal thing. But as she was walking down, you could see a friend watching her, looking at her. You could see her looking at her coat. And then you could see her looking at her hood. Just thinking, it looks a bit like a bucket, that. And a friend came back, had a bit of a, a, bit of a chat with each other, and they discovered to their absolute joy that it was a detachable hood. <laughs> so they helped each other to get the hood off and they stood there at the tap with this, this weird flexible bucket thing they'd got ready to go. And they, they pressed the button and the water went into the hood but it just soaked in because it was like the lining on the inside of the hood soaked in and they were disappointed with this because they thought they were onto something. And that's, that's when the teacher walked over. Now, you've got a couple of ways of dealing with this as a teacher, I think, can't you? You can go one of two ways. Um, uh, to be honest, if you're a teacher of older kids, there's only one way, isn't there? There's only one response. You pack it in, what are you doing? Get in the neck from your mother. But the teacher that walked over, she was the four-year-old's teacher, foundation stage teacher, and she did what all great foundation stage teachers do. She opened with a question. She started with a question, because actually that's how they live their lives. And if you ever go, you know those people who work with four-year-olds, if you go and ask them something, they don't give you an answer. They will just come back at you with another question. <laughs> so you're eight and say, can you tell me the time? Now that's an interesting question. I wonder how we could find out. Just tell me before you know it, you're up the corridor, counting in five. <laughs> so, just tell me. Um, they do it all the time. With children, it's incredibly powerful. She went up and she went, hey girls, that looks really interesting. Can you tell me what you're doing? The girls started to explain it had this idea about the hood as the bucket, but the water was just disappearing, it's just going, it's just going. And then she said, oh, well, I wonder, I wonder what would happen if we turned it inside out. And she helped the girls turn the hood inside out. And then the second incredible thing happened, because she just walked off, she just left them. Now, for me, I've been teaching year six for, for too long, there's no way I'd have passed up on that opportunity for a little bit of teaching, I'd have been straight in. But like, right girls, you see now, we've got the waterproof layer on the inside of the hood, that means it's non-porous, that means the water will stay, I tell you what, come on me, we'll do a worksheet, come on, get a worksheet done. <laughs> Let's get some evidence in books, come on. <laughs> Foundation, monkey proof thinker, this one, the teacher. She knew all of that waterproofiness stuff, she knew it all, but she chose to withhold her knowledge in that moment. And actually, what was the only thing those girls cared about? 
Just, they just wanted to feel, exactly. She could have said all she wanted. Wouldn't have made the blindest bit of difference to those girls. They wouldn't have paid any attention. What I found out later, and this is the skill, I think, of foundation day teachers, those teachers of four-year-olds. I found out that she went back to those girls later on in the day. And she said to them, hey, you know that thing you were doing? I thought it was fantastic. I wonder, it's a phrase again, I wonder if we could find anything else that would work in the same way. And then they were off again, weren't they? Off again. In the moment she left them, withheld and all she left them to it. And it worked. It worked a treat. The water did stay in the hood. And it was quite difficult to carry and everything, but they could do it. And they carried it carefully around and they tipped it out into the bowls and they did it again and again and again. And, and then the other kids cottoned on. The other kids noticed. All the hoods were off. <laughs> the vast majority weren't even detachable. <laughs> <laughs> Sheer force of will. <laughs> now, I love that. I love that kind of thinking. That's the kind of thinking we'd love to see from, from all of our young people. I think that's phenomenal, that. But actually, it might never have happened. It might never have happened. We might never have seen any of that. If we just go back to, to, to this and that 30 minutes those teachers spent, those like seemingly insignificant decisions that were made actually went on to have a massive impact in terms of learning. We could just have gone down the straightforward route. We could have just put the tap in the mud kitchen because it's the obvious place to put it and it's straightforward. That's where we put it. We could have made it a tap that the children could have used totally independently. We could have put hooks on the back fence and put pans along there. They could have worked in total isolation and the outcome would have been the same, wouldn't it? Those children would be able to make mud pies and mud soup just like those two little girls did. But look at what would have been missed out on that little journey. I'm just going to share a quote with you here that kind of sums up the importance of this kind of I think because certainly in England we have got phenomenal at the flight of the bullet stuff and to be honest wherever you are and whatever curriculum you've got where there is stuff to teach there will always be the temptation to use the flight of the bullet approach to be honest it was how I was trained as a teacher I was trained with that path of least resistance model start with the end in mind start with the end in mind and then you plot that path to get the children there in the most efficient way possible because we've been told things like our lessons have to have pace. If I could ban one word from teaching, it would be pace because of the way it's misinterpreted. And if you've got pace, then, then you can't have that. This, this idea of, of this kind of liminal space in between kind of knowing and, and or not knowing and knowing. And what I've tried to do throughout the majority of my career is get from there to there along the quickest route. And I've kind of circumvented this, this bit in the middle because actually that's a little bit frightening for a teacher. Because in that bit, we might not be quite sure where the edges are. There might be some uncertainty. There might be some struggle. But actually, it's in that area where the conditions are created for pushing children into a different kind of thinking, for pushing children into being creative, critical thinkers. That's where it happens, not with this jump but in the middle. And that's something we've got to cling on to, I think, as teachers. Um, and we do that through having this blended pedagogy. And this isn't about curriculum. This is about us. It's us. We need those different ways of operating. And again, just to keep the analogy going with the whole nut business, we've got to have that range of tools in our toolkit. The nuts on a plate stuff we've talked about. Now, at the beginning, I kind of did that down a little bit, but actually, that's really important. That's part of our bread and butter. Nuts on a plate stuff, actually, there's times when that is the right thing to be doing. I know stuff as the teacher, and I'm going to teach it to you in a very direct way. I'm going to do it creatively for all the reasons that I spoke about before, but essentially, I'm going to do it because actually, it's a really efficient way of building knowledge. It's not the only way, but it's really efficient. And like I say, our bread and butter, we shouldn't try and get away from that. It just can't be the only thing. We've got to balance it. The other thing we looked at, the nuts in a box stuff, I define this as being guided discovery. Guided discovery. Creating and managing desirable difficulties. Regulating complexity. That right there, that's the skill of the foundation stage teachers. Those teachers who teach those four and five year olds, that's, that's what we need to go and look at. And then we need to try and take that and replicate that as far as we can. And it is guided discovery. I used to have a bit of a misconception about foundation stage, about the teachers of four year olds. Uh, in fact, what is the, what is the only way of getting a response out of a foundation say teacher that's not a question. What do you say to them that really winds them up? What you do all day is just play. You just play all day. And that's when you, get, you don't get a question in response to that. You get something very different. <laughs> they, get, they hate it. They get angry. Because actually, it can sometimes look like that. This idea of them just going and discovering and exploring for themselves. 
That never happens in a great foundation stage. It never happens with great foundation stage teachers. They're just incredibly subtle. And sometimes we miss that. Because again, for me, as a teacher of older children, I've got used to being the loud one in the room, the one dictating things. Foundation stage, different. Interactions are happening all of the time. That teacher, <coughs> she was watching what was going on with that hood, and she intervened just at the moment where frustration would have tipped them into giving up. And she went over there and she opened with a question and then she dropped in a wondering. Oh, I wonder, I wonder what would happen if we turned it inside out. And then equally she knew that it was time for her to get out of there and leave them to it. So she went in and she went out within a couple of seconds. That's subtle. She went back to them later in the day and she, she kind of got set them off again. And again, that's subtle. Um, and like I say, they're not left to it. Those practitioners are there, and they're feeding things in. They're nudging children along. Um, they're giving them little hints of tips, dropping in some wonderings. That's the thing that encourages that creative thinking. And then, obviously, we're talking about kind of extremes, I suppose, on a spectrum, aren't we? You've got your nuts-on-a-plate stuff, direct teaching, and then your monkey-proof box at the other end, guided discovery. There's stuff in between. And I don't know whether you, you're kind of active on Twitter, whether you follow people on Twitter, whether you follow educational people on Twitter, but one of the things that really winds me up about it is that you do get colleagues, mainly secondary colleagues, if I'm totally honest, who believe you have to be in one of those two camps, that you're either a traditionalist teacher and you solely use direct instruction, and you sit the kids in rows and you talk at them, you do loads of rote learning, or you're a progressive and you just like dance around with a flower in your hair all day discovering stuff. <laughs> I've, I've never come across an actual teacher, certainly in primary, that is one of those two things. There are times when I am Mr. Traditional Direct Teaching, that's what I'll be doing. And there'll be other times where I do the dancing around and the flower stuff, or an aspect of it. But then there'll be loads of other times where I'm somewhere in between. Somewhere in between, because it's never black and white. There's always a range of strategies. The one I've got in the middle here is just an example. So falling somewhere between nuts on a plate and nuts in the box, this idea of having nuts scattered in the clearing. Okay, then, so actually, I'm not going to teach you the thing you need to know, but I'm just going to make sure the nuts are out there. I'm going to make sure the learning's out there in the classroom. You'll be able to access it, uh, and I'll support you with that. So I'll facilitate it. I'll make it easier. But essentially, you've got to do it for yourselves. And again, one of the things that pushes us to do, or pushes the children to do, is develop some of that independence. And that is sorely needed, I think, in our schools. Because again, if you want to see or find the most independent children in most schools, you do have to go to foundation stage and not the other end. Because by that point, they've had some of it knocked out of them. I made a joke about that little girl putting the sponge back. But actually, the children I've taught, it's not that much of a joke. I had one of my most um, able year sixes, going back when we had levels a couple of years ago, when we knew what we were doing. He came into, <laughs> came into year six, nailed on level six. So like the top like three, four percent academically, nationally. And we got to kind of April time, just before SATs. And we were just doing like practice questions. We have this program called Test Space. It's like a massive database of old SATs questions. And I just printed off some like level six questions for him to practice, knowing he could do them, just for practice. And I left them on his table. And after about three or four minutes, he came up to me and he said, Mr. Lear, I can't do those questions. I said, oh, well, would it help if I read them to you? And he went, oh, no, 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 no. It's not that. I broke my pencil. <laughs> what? Top three, four percent academically, nationally. Stop. I have never come across a four-year-old that can't find something to write with if they need it. You know, crayon, felt tip, stick, blood, makes no difference. <laughs> they need to make a mark, if they will make a mark, won't they? If we've got teachers that can do this, the curriculum bit, <coughs> that's an irrelevance. It, it's just a document. It's just a document. We're the ones... We're the ones that make it happen, and we've got the power to take those different routes. We can reduce, as teachers, any curriculum, no matter how creative it is, to nuts on a plate. We can reduce it to that. Or we can do amazing things with it. We can exercise that, that power that we've got to use that range of strategies. And we can give our children exactly the kind of conditions and um, environment they need to explore that kind of thinking. Um, I hope that's kind of one of the main things that's come across, that sense of kind of empowerment. I do believe, like I say, curriculum's in irrelevance, and I think, really, you know, we need to curriculum proof ourselves, because God knows what will happen in five years' time. I know what will happen in England, we'll have another bunch of idiots, and there'll be another crap curriculum, but <laughs> that's just, we need to be curriculum proof, we need to have strategies, ways of dealing with it so that they still get the education they deserve. Um, and if I haven't quite hammered home the point about the power that we've got just enough, I'm just going to share one last thing with you. Um, 
And this was a letter. This, I got this letter not too long ago, actually. It came through the post and everything, like most letters do, I suppose. And uh, <laughs> A letter from the king. <laughs> That's true, <right>, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this wasn't from the king. And the letter came because I've got... Um, I'll have to, I should just give it some context. I have, a, I, I have my own company, which is called Gorilla Education, which essentially is just me. It's nothing fancy. Uh, it's mainly for tax reasons, if I'm honest. <laughs> and, uh, and I also have my car, which is leased through my company also for tax reasons and, uh, and I'd been out and about in the car and I'd, I'd stayed in a, in a car park and it turned out that I'd overstayed my welcome and it was a, a Euro car park so these people here and I'd overstayed my welcome by six minutes six minutes too long that was it and I got a letter and they were just explaining politely you know that I'd, I'd been there too long overstayed my welcome uh, and, and that I would have to pay a £75 fine for six minutes £75 but if I'm totally honest I would have paid double that because this is this is I think, the best correspondence that I've ever <laughs> received. Because just look, just look at who they addressed it to. <laughs> That's me, that. <laughs> and if I can be Mr. Education, then anyone can. <laughs> um, You've been an absolute pleasure to speak to you yeah, this yeah, afternoon. Yeah. Thank you very, very much for listening to me. Thank you. Um, oh. <laughs> I can't come all the way here and not plug my book. <laughs> this is, uh, the, lots of the stuff I've talked about is in here. There's loads more, obviously. Um, I, I would strongly recommend you buy a copy. Um, <laughs> And lots of copies for colleagues and things like that. Um, you can get it from Amazon and places like that. Crown House, also sell it. Gorilla Teaching, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> um, what we've got brilliant at doing, I think, with the creative conversation is getting people to come back and give us the same messages in different ways that sound totally fresh. And that consistency, Jonathan, thanks for that. But let's just open up for questions or comments from anyone. Yes. Can I ask, Jonathan, I mean, how do you take that stuff and do the older kids then, the jaded ones, the ones that are a bit, so you're year sixes, do you, are you able to? You know, I'm in high school, can I, I, mean, I can't see me being able to do anything much creative, I've got to be honest, you know, kind of with um, presentation classes, but I can imagine trying to be more kind of critical. Yes. Yeah. I think, no. I'd, uh, no, I don't think it's too late. I think it's much more difficult, and I think there are aspects whereby, uh, kind of in primary, certainly in England, we are we're letting our, our secondary colleagues down. Certainly around independence, because by the time they're hitting secondary, it, it, it's really difficult to put back because it's actually ingrained. As soon as those kids come out of reception into year one, sometimes things get very very formal, and then they've got a diet of it for six or so years. Um, the creativity aspects, I think it's uh, how you view that. I suppose it's two ways, isn't there? There is the creativity of the teacher. And I think with those older jaded kids, I think it's not necessarily about um, a, a being the, the kind of idiot dressed up at the front and stuff like that. With you, that's teacher creativity, I suppose. I think there's lots of potential for pushing those older children into creative thinking themselves. Um, there's a, a piece of research done by a, a cognitive psychologist called Robert Bjork, and the whole idea around desirable difficulties is, is his. It's not, I haven't made that up. Um, and the research he did was actually into impact on retention of learning. So not necessarily the creative thinking, but retention of learning. And some of the desirable difficulties that he talks about are incredibly simple to kind of implement. Uh, so, for example, um, the idea of generation. That was, there was four desirable difficulties he kind of categorised. Generation was one. And essentially it was just, rather than giving a child a particular word, uh, giving it them as like an anagram, scrambled up, or giving them just the, the first two letters of the word, and making them work at the rest of it. Now, th again, that sounds like thing in the world but there was loads of research to suggest that had that had a massive impact on retention of that information so again in any given lesson right the way through secondary you know you, that's something you could apply tomorrow in terms of that kind of transition there were others in there which again were, were secondary really they were around spacing and interleaving um, and then there was another one around um, perceptual uh, perceptual difficulties which was around uh, the research that suggests that presenting things in a font that is slightly awkward and smaller leads to deeper processing uh, and if I think about the way in which I'd always presented stuff to my kids, if I thought about my lower ability table, my lemons table, my dippers, um, <laughs> I'd print out keywords. <laughs> I'd, I'd print out keywords for those kids.
kids. You know, I'd always have resources prepared. And for whatever reason, I used to print them out in like a double big font. Because as well as being a bit thick, they were also a bit short-sighted. Do you know what I mean? That was... <laughs> it's just mental. But his research suggested... It wasn't that we have, we have information from kind of support for learning kind of needs that a better font in certain kind of sizes. It might be about that. Exactly. exactly. Like, and I, I think don't know, maybe using one one time and one something else, I don't know. It was, it was just it was an interesting thing. I mean, they, like I say, the, the research on the font stuff was, he wasn't suggesting that we should turn all our fonts into awkward and small size fonts. But again, it's, I suppose it's, it makes you think different. It's counterintuitive, that, because what our general mindset is around making life easier for the children. That's our default setting, I think, as teachers. Making, because uh, for a number of reasons, uh, pace, having to get through lessons, having to cover stuff. Uh, also, we are fuss adverse. We don't like fuss. So it's easier to have them stationary and sitting and deliver to them. Um, and so actually, the alternative to that it, it takes more thought, I suppose. And uh, there has to be a point whereby, as a teacher, that, that's the choice you have to make. Am I willing, for this particular lesson, to think about it more than the kind of thinking that would enable me just to deliver it directly? Because it's easy, isn't it? I mean, I could stand in a classroom all day long and just teach kids, because it's easy. I find it easy. The other stuff, though, I have to think an awful lot harder about. And so how often do we want to go through that thinking in our busy, over crowded lives. Do you know what I mean? Um, that's the decision. I think there are very small ways you can sneak it in, where you could do it frequently over certain lessons. There are other ways where actually it might just be a lesson a week where you think, right, for this lesson, for this group of year eight or whatever they're called, I'm going to actively go out and try and disrupt this process. I'm going to think of one spanner that I can throw in the works and just and see what happens. Um, and again, it would be the kind of lesson for me as a teacher where I'd make sure nobody was watching it um, because that spanner might be too big. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it might cause a bit of fuss. Um, but I would experiment behind closed doors, just me, just the kids. Oh, right. Yeah. Let's just see what happens if. And then kind of just go for it. Um. I mean, for me, I think just it's worth having a look at a couple of things. One of the things is Neil Winton, who's an English teacher, has got a really good post on Perigu, and you can check it out. And it's a, a number of people in the room are familiar with it. But he does this. He asks his second year class to answer the question, what is beauty? And he, he says to them that they can answer it in any way that they like. And then he, he links you on to a, effectively a PowerPoint that one of his students has presented. And I've used that a lot because it, it gets at what you talk about, Jonathan, is the, the concept of balance. Um, what, what he gets from this girl particularly, and he's there are other examples you can use, but the point he gets from this girl is absolutely brilliant in terms of giving you something that's hugely powerful and emotionally affecting, but there are no apostrophes, um, and there are some real fundamental issues around the, the formal grammar elements of it, and you show it to people, and people will be blown away by it, and really struck by it, and then you say, how easy do you think it would be now to get her to correct the grammar in that? And everybody immediately is, yeah, right. And it's that idea around if you if you make the move that Jonathan's talking about, what you have to be assiduous about is capturing the learning. Um, and again, sorry, not not to keep plugging it because I know I've done it before. But one of the bits that that I've been working on with Howell Roberts, um, and I'd love to do the same thing with you, is to go through this idea of yeah, this is great, you know, how to imagine it up but then trying to work with people on how you engineer it back down again, because that's your worry, isn't it? That you'll, you'll offer the experience, but not capture the learning. And when you're concerned about offering the experience and not capturing the learning, you deliver the learning. And it's working through that way of thinking. And some of the ideas that we've put into that, there's a wee film, which if you're interested, we'll send you links to, that we've done where Howell's working with classes, he's talking about what he's doing, and then I'm doing all this boring stuff, the, the ignorable bollocks, as he describes it. Um, <laughs> but I do all this stuff about how do you turn it around and capture the learning. And, and I think that's the issue for secondary. Because in history, you know, you can, I mean, classically, you can teach the content and never get the understanding. But that you can pose questions. You know, you can pose questions in history. You can pose questions in geography. You can do all of these things. You just need to make sure that you capture <coughs> the learning alongside it. And it's achieving that balance, I think, is the issue. Apologies. Well, then, just to contribute to the conversation, I've got two or three points, and one of them was exactly that. So Sorry, mate. 
um, the, so, some, some really respected history um, uh, teaching professionals uh, who trained history teachers say the single thing you want out of uh, a history or a geography teacher, the single thing that demonstrates a good teacher rather than a less good teacher is not pace or all that, it's the construction of an appropriate question through a lesson or a sequence of lessons or a whole year. And um, we've been experimenting doing that in science, so instead of doing, we're doing genetics this week, you do, why do men have nipples? And when you start beginning to explore, actually you can go much ruder if you want to. There's all sorts of, why is the sky blue? Why, um, you know, how can I measure the height of my school building? You, know, you, you can find that the, the teacher's job is to find a question that pulls in all the required understanding that you want. And if they can answer the question at the end, then you've done your thing of capturing the learning. So that's, that's yeah. one thing that I'm really excited about. The other one is just a kind of comment for open suggestion, maybe. Uh, there's a campaign to raise the age at which students start formal primary education, and I just throw that out as to whether that's part of the answer. You know, more play, structured play, or the appropriate phrases. Um, seven up, is it? Upstart Scotland. Upstart Scotland. But, but it, you know, that again, uh, this brilliant uh, as well, because that whole thing about why do men have nipples? You know, absolutely cracking question. Um, and and if, if, you, if they have to present the answer back, you know, that ceases to be again in science. That becomes again in language, in metaphor, and also it gets you into all sorts of areas around thinking about gender and gender <coughs> stereotype potential. It's hugely... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I know. I think I, that I, is, um, I'm already trying to construct an answer <laughs> in my own head. I'm just like, I mean, my nipples are actually tingling with the <laughs> same. I think, I think that. The I, 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 think, I think that's probably why I've got them. <laughs> Men have nipples for the that's occasional fun. tingle. Uh, discuss, I think. That's it. Anyone else? Any other points or questions? I think. Can I just say that, that I think both of the things you've said there tie into that idea of of planning for learning and not planning for lessons. And I th that's the, the, one of the things that we get tied to sometimes is that, that unit. So, uh, and again, I don't think it's our fault necessarily. Certainly in England, we've had messages from Ofsted that have told us that children need to, that, that they believe they can actually see learning in a lesson, for starters, and that there needs to be rapid and sustained progress within a lesson, whatever that means. And actually, that, that forces you into a particular way of thinking as a teacher. You think about your start and your finish point and what they need to know, and as a result, you feel forced into that delivery stuff, don't you? That question is about learning, and essentially, we, isn't it? We, we got into a conversation about this uh, around the last creative conversation we had around the work that we'd done in St. Francis. And one of the things I was saying then, so I think so a number of people have heard it, you know, I've, I'm now continually saying that we need to stop talking about best practice. You know, and, and the thing I always do around it is always say, right, anyone in the room who's ever raised attainment on a windy day, put your <laughs> hand up, <laughs> right? And, and there's a significant absence of hands in the room. And everybody's going off on a not on a windy day. You know, Nicola, <laughs> Nicola, never heed all that reason attainment stuff. Just stop the wind, because it's crack cocaine for children. And we can, you know, and, and we go through that. And the, the point that I kept coming back to is this idea that we never talk about sustainable practice. Talk about best practice, talk about good practice, talk about sustainable practice. And the thing that I use in that conversation was I'd been teaching a primary two class in St. Francis and, and Craig Miller and I only had, the last morning I was working with them, I only had one major incident and that was like a really good day mm -hmm. and the class teacher was looking at me, as I said before, like I was Captain America, you know, he's just looking adoringly at me like I was a hero and I just went over and I put my arm around him and I said, Andrew, there's one thing you need to remember and he says, what's that? I says, I'm not coming back this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and <laughs> and it's that whole thing, isn't it, that we, we've created this idolatry of the event. Um, and I loved what you just said about planning for learning, not planning for lessons. Because that's what we do, we unitize. And you know, actually, uh, again, one of the other things I've been talking about a lot with people is that I don't know why anybody does a lesson observation. I have no idea why anybody does a lesson observation, unless it's to learn from it in some way, but, but the three reasons. One, I never did a lesson observation and was surprised. You know, I never went into a lesson thinking, she's a genius, and came out thinking she's rubbish. 
That just never happened. Almost every time I did a lesson observation, it simply confirmed what I thought before, most of the time. Second thing, lessons don't make any difference at all. You know, that you can teach one good lesson if it's not followed by another one. It's just snow on a summer's day. Um, lessons have very little impact. They might be a good kickoff, they might be a good starter, but they are a unique experience within the context of the wider courses which deliver genuine learning. And the third reason that I, I stopped doing them was that the only point in a lesson observation is so you can have a conversation with the teacher about the learning. Why not take their class? They then get 45, 55 minutes to do something else and you actually get to speak to the children in the class. You get to look at the work that people have been doing, not in that lesson, but across the time that the teachers had them. And you actually get a much stronger basis, I would argue, for that conversation about learning and practice than you would do from watching them. I mean, voyeurism is an unproductive activity. You know, honestly, <laughs> some people might like it, but you don't want to overindulge in it. You know, compared to that experiential learning, I think it's hugely important. So just some stuff around that I think it's worth thinking about. Anything else for Jonathan? It's quite interesting what you're saying about, um, I've got my, this real, my staff teasing because I've got a real bugbear in my hat, the primary four do the Vikings, you know, <laughs> primary seven, or primary one do autumn. It's the same bloody thing every year. It's still autumn, the leaves still change colour. Why are we still teaching in this in primary three, you yeah. know? And it's just about actually saying, to them, I was like, I want to get rid of these topic boxes to free up your ability to be creative about it. You know, look at the ease and the, oh, you know, the, the, the directions, look at the ease and those that we have. Yeah. There's a real drive forward for these bundling of ease and those. So you're actually putting, finding that common thread, finding yeah. the ones that are core skills, and actually just coming up with the children. Well, how can we learn about this? Mm, yeah. and what are you interested in? Yeah. And let's see how we can apply that. So that's something, just as you were sharing, yeah. about getting excited about that, I think, <laughs> that move away from that is yeah. something that we as primary head teachers are really excited I mean, we'd, uh, we've used a, a similar approach to the, the question that was given there uh, across the whole curriculum. So we've, we've used philosophy for children, for you see, for quite a long time now. Uh, and now we use a project-based learning model whereby we, we just um, we, we cover quite a bit less stuff, but just do it really well. That's our intention. So we don't follow the national curriculum for history or anything like that in England, which is this ridiculous chronology from like Stone Age to Glorious Revolution. So what we've done is, again, to, to break that pattern of do we always doing uh, Henry VIII was a classic Tudor, rich and poor in Tudor times, year five it was, and it was just horrific, 20 years of that. Um, and so we went to like a project-based learning uh, essential questions. So now we've, got, we've taken these broader, almost philosophical questions which allow us to explore all sorts of different things. Um, so our year sixes, for example, at the moment are working on a project, or uh, well the essential question is, um, does adversity always make you stronger? And essentially, that used to be called um, uh, uh, something around, I don't know, volcanoes and earthquakes. Uh, it was your classic geography, yeah? Now, that geography still happens within that, and all of the forces stuff that happens in science. So we haven't necessarily shifted stuff massively in the curriculum, but all of a sudden, you've got something more interesting to answer, and you've got uh, RE that feeds into that, you've got PSHE that feeds into that. Um, and again, we've tried to, to work on creating those questions for every single class. So it's not about a period in history. You've got a question. The period in history you choose to do with your children, that's entirely up to you. So we're not at all prescriptive about content coverage. We've, our non-negotiables are skills-based, entirely skills-based, and they underpin everything. And so that, cause that gives you the freedom then, doesn't it? Um, so yeah. And we need to recognize the tension around, because you know, one of my things I used to bang on about um, was when the Titanic was really popular as a topic. You know, we're doing the Titanic, as hell's <laughs> uh, What are you doing? We're doing the Titanic. And it was this astonishing thing that well, if I went into schools after they'd done it, typically kids would know where it was built. They would know how heavy it was. They, knew, they would know how big it was. They would know all sorts of stuff about the Titanic, you know, and were continually in quest for a pub quiz where they would be asked about the Titanic as a special <laughs> subject. And, and they would go through all of that. And then commonly the other thing they would do is they, they would do a wee play, right? And in the play... All that would happen, and uh, you know, the play was all about you know the different groups and the Titanic, and it was brilliant because you know that even working class kids, in working class schools and really poor communities, 
put on accents <laughs> to be steerage passengers, you know. <laughs> so you would get kids who came from, you know, Methyl and Fife or whatever, you know, and they'd go, oh, bro, go, bro, 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 bro. <laughs> virtually incomprehensible. And they thought that the steerage passenger was like an extra from Oliver. You know, they're all like dressed like the Artful Dodger and they're muttering incomprehensibly in the style of Jim Smith. If you don't take anything else from today, apart from the native genius of Jonathan Lear, Go away and Google Jim Smith, Darth Vader. <laughs> and it, it's, the, it's the Star Wars version of Fife. It's just the best Fife accent thing ever in the history of the world. But kids would do that. And, and all, all the first class passengers all sounded like Camilla Parker Bowles <laughs> or whatever she is now. And they, they all, we'd all go to the Oxfam shop and they'd all have like long... <laughs> So you've got these conversations which are going on between the steerage passenger <laughs> who dress like the artful dog, <laughs> and that was it. And so at the end of this whole period spent studying the Titanic, they knew how heavy it was and they'd learnt to stereotype. And I was saying that, you know, the only point in doing the Titanic is that it's a society located in place and time where the dynamics are exposed by a dramatic event which causes the whole fabric of that particular society be, to be revealed in that context. And yet at the end, because that wasn't what we assessed, it wasn't what the kids took away from it. And what you really wanted them to take away, and presumably you wanted them to take away some knowledge about the Titanic, but you also wanted them to take away some tools so that they could look at the society that they lived in and hopefully advance their understanding of it. Because we never assessed it, it never happened. And that's what's creating the tension for lots of secondary colleagues is that ultimately, no matter what they teach, the exams are still predominantly based in knowledge and understanding. And there's still that concern around that for National 5 English, some of the questions might be so specific that if I don't actually cover them, the kids won't be able to get them. And one of the challenges from Jonathan, which I think is great, we actually need to think through what's going to get kids more marks. You know, we actually need to have that conversation around what's going to get kids more marks. Is it exhaustively trying to cover the curriculum? Is it revision rather than resilience? Because that's the challenge you're posing in a way. What, we, we, what we'll conveniently do is, and again in secondary schools, and I loved your question around that, what we'll often do in secondary schools is we'll offer more and more revision. So we're trying to make every question a first question, but kids don't fail first questions, they fail last questions. The exercises that they do poorly, and where they lose marks, I've said this about a million times, is when they get into the paper where they're dealing with a question that they didn't think they would have to do. And we haven't developed that capacity for them to question and analyse the question, to then think what they can bring to answer it, and then put the two together. They haven't been taught how to think. And as a result, their scores go like that as they go through. And as we revise more and more, we'll tend to get marginal gains in the early parts of assessment and still only get marginal gains in the latter part. And it's just that thinking through. We're not saying that this is the right way. But the biggest thing I love, Jonathan, I mean, there's so many things I absolutely love about what you did. But one of the biggest things for me is this thing of balance, that we waste so much bloody time on pointless dichotomies, that it has to be either or. And one of the great things about this is we had Jonathan here. We also had Martin Robinson, whom I, some people might have seen the conversations on YouTube if you want to go and have a look at it. And Martin is all about the knowledge. You know, he's like, you shouldn't be allowed to create anything until you've absolutely got the grammar and got the knowledge and got everything else around it. And, you know, you're conceding that there are elements in what Martin does and Martin talks about that are right. He just needs to get out of his own buttocks and, you know, see the balance on the other side of the argument as well. Because the one question, that, and he's a, Martin was brilliant and a clever, clever guy, the question that he really struggled on was, so are you suggesting that that's what early years should be like? And basically, he'd never done early years, so he never thought about it. And was immediately caught on that hook. And it's that interesting thing that I think Jonathan's saying is, let's not get in hooks Let's not get caught. Let's just actually look and say, well, what is it that makes a difference? And hugely interesting concepts. Desirable difficulty, I think, a brilliant concept. You know, that, that the creative curriculum is not about dumbing down. It's about adding in that level of desirable difficulty that forces the young person to bring more to the challenge, be it a science challenge, 
be it a math challenge, be it an, a, an early years challenge or beyond. The idea of progression, one of the other things, we, you know, you, Jonathan you didn't talk about strategies for progression, but that whole concept of progression was huge. We don't know how independent children are in their learning because we don't tell each other. You know, there are no learning pathways where kids come in and you've got a breakdown, some indication of where they sit in analysis or synthesis or whatever the skills happen to be. And, and you know, just final note around this, one of my problems just now in Scottish education is we have so many unused resources. Um, you know, we're talking about workload, we're talking about simplifying um, curriculum for excellence. We've got four building the curriculum documents, all less than 2,000 words. Nobody's talking about <coughs> them. And instead of going back and talking about that, nobody's talking about the excellence group report on higher order skills, which was done four or five years ago, covers lots of the ground that Jonathan covered, much more interestingly and much more entertainingly today. Nobody talks about it. We've got a creative learning plan. Nobody looks at it. And it's that whole thing that there are a number of the tools there that we can take advantage of and use, which we're allowing simply to rust and fester. And in the meantime, we're trying to solve the workload problem by introducing a whole range of new benchmarks. Because that's what we needed. <laughs> you know? I mean, we are not satisfied. We are not satisfied with a tome of experiences and outcomes. We were crying out for another set of benchmarks to overlay that. And part of that is about us not having the confidence that you've demonstrated today. And, and the, last, the last point, you know, that wonderful thing, indulge yourself in ignoring the bollocks. Um, and have some belief in what you think and what you take forward. Yes. Um, I just wanted to throw to this, just come to me about this idea of desirable difficulties. I took a primary school group round the National Portrait Gallery yesterday and we went into an exhibition called Modern Portrait and I stood in quite a big space with a bench in and there were three really big paintings. One was a really colourful one, primary colours of two men kind of in this primary coloured space, three people having a conversation. One was a tiny little passport sized photo of a head in a massive white frame. Another one was a huge canvas of a man standing in what looked like an aircraft aircraft hangar with pieces of engineering around it. And the, the fourth one, if any of you know it, is Ken Curry's painting of the three oncologists, which is creepy and scary, and there's three men with ghostly white faces with blood on their hands about to go into an operating theatre. And I said, right, we, we can talk about any of these paintings, you can have any of these four, which ones do you want? Thinking they'd choose the bright, colourful one. They all chose the creepy, scary, horrible, which I felt was actually the most difficult painting for children to want to look at, but they chose that one. And we sat for about probably half of the session that they had, quarter, maybe quarter, two-thirds of the session they had, just talking about that one painting that they all, and I said, what is it? Why is it that you want to look at that painting? It's really interesting because how many occasions where actually we would make that decision for them? You know, I, I can think of times I've done it. You just put stuff out on the tables because that's the thing I assume they will be interested in and it links most closely to my learning. But yeah, actually, and they go dark. And I, I never underestimate how much children value the importance of meaning. You know, because that's, that's the other thing. They, they actually chose something which they had to think about. Not simply because they chose something they had to think about rather than something which was just an immediate visual appeal. And again, I think there's something worth thinking about that. I honestly think it's time we had some wine or whatever <laughs> you, you choose to drink. It's certainly time <laughs> I had some wine. Um, could I yet again just say how bloody stupid am I? Um, I've done it again, haven't I? I've brought some other brilliant blooming <laughs> presenter <laughs> up here whom people are now going to book in droves. <laughs> you know, so n uh, not enough that I unleash Howl Roberts and Deborah Kidd and Lisa Ashes and everybody else. I've now unleashed him um, and I'm sure that's like another 18 bookings that I can completely <laughs> stroke off my schedule. But to be honest with you, for the sheer pleasure of listening to you, Jonathan, and for the sheer pleasure of hearing the content and the challenging ideas you put across, it's worth a few bookings. <laughs> Thank, Cheers. You. Thank you. Thank you very much.